Dr. Michael Fine. Good afternoon. It was a wonderful presentation we just heard, though it gave me some pain because uh, when we heard described the uh, marriage of high deductible major medical uh, to direct primary care, I remembered that Larry and I spent, I don't know, six months in 2006 or 2007 knocking on the door of every insurance company we could find um, to try to get them to adopt that model. Um, and we got no place because the time wasn't right and the support wasn't right. Um, so, Michael Fine, I'm a family doc, uh, public health guy, author, troublemaker of many years duration. I know many of you. Um, I'm really honored that somebody who works with my medical school section partner is here. That's how old I am, but it's so thrilled. Um, and I'm thrilled to be with uh, many others in this room who have been participants in primary care uh, for all Americans. Actually, um, we have a number of board members and other active members. Would you please stand up? just so we can give you a round of applause. Come on up. <laughs> this is a labor of love, and there's, you know, and, and in my view of the world, it may be um, our only hope. Um, Jeff, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit about what states can do. Um, what I didn't say by way of introduction is I spent four years in state government as a regulator, as a director of the Royal Department of Health, um, and I found out right quick, <coughs> as tough a guy as I tried to be, how the political process torpedoed me at every turn. I someday in another time will tell the story about me and CVS, and as I tried to just put some controls on MediClinic, um, how they nearly killed me, tapped my phone, did a bunch of other wild stuff. Um, and because CVS is, is headquartered in Rhode Island which is a, a state after all, um, even though it's a tiny one. Anyway, um, because this is the Innovators Network, I thought I'd try, try to talk about the new ideas um, that were coming from Primary Care for All Americans, because I talked about it last year as an innovation, so it's not quite an innovation anymore, but we've learned a bunch of stuff. But first, I thought I'd frame it by talking about some old ideas that are important framing about what we all do and what we have to accomplish. First, every time anybody says we have a healthcare system, I want to melt. We do not have a healthcare system that supplies the same set of services to everyone. We have a market that exists to sell stuff. That's what it's all for. Jeff referred to that. It's absolutely true. Um, and it is not only destroying health and healthcare, um, but if you think about it in a certain way, it's under undermining democracy itself, which I'll talk in a bit. Um, that market exists only to create profit for its market participants. The profit is actually built on public dollars. 60 to 70 percent of every dollar spent in healthcare starts to spend money. Um, so it is all ours um, and it's all being captured and that money is money that um, is taken from communities either by tax dollars um, or by uh, reducing what people earn uh, per hour as in the workplace. Um, and that money is money um, that ought to be spent on education, housing, public transportation, public parks, the environment, the community development, the social determinants of health, um, because those are things that matter for public health outcomes. And that we are part, we are agents of that uh, extraction of funds is something that should keep us all up at night because that's what's happened to healthcare and that is what has happened to us. Um, so that's something you need to think about and what I think about every day when I get up in the morning and when I go to sleep at night and sometimes it keeps me from sleeping at night. The other thing you need to know is the healthcare business spends between 750 million and a billion dollars a year on lobbying, which is exactly how it stays the way it is. And if you want to understand how this thing is affecting democracy, well, think about it in this way. If somebody's spending money to keep uh, Congress and states from doing what they need to do to protect people's health, that money is being used to undermine the democratic process. And we are unwitting participants in that, um, and that's why we need to stand up, you know, sort of come together as a group 
um, stand up and, I hate to use this word, fight and change. Um, and the other thing that I learned in all this time, um, and that we've learned, is that nobody's in charge. No one is in charge. I have been at all the tables at state and federal government. You know, I was there when CMMI was created. And I know with great clarity, and I can tell you these stories at great length, that no one is in charge. So if we don't stand up and, Scott, thanks for your direction, if we don't stand up and lead, there's no one else to do it. A little scary, but true. Now I'm going to run through some stuff really quickly, because you all know this. You know, we spend way too much money, five trillion in the United States, twice the average of the other developed nation, uh, going up twice the level of general inflation, usually now costing close to $15,000 per person per year on average for communities. I live in a little place called Situate, Rhode Island, um, 10,000 people. So we spent $150 million, or $150 million is spent for us on health care based on those numbers. And I compared it to the other services that Little Situate, Rhode Island supplies for its residents. Garbage pickup, schools, police, fire, you know, everything else. We're spending $40 million a year, so we're spending two and a half times on health care, or three and a half times on health care, what we're spending on everything else. And think about what it would be like if we were like other organized <laughs> countries in the world and spent half of what we're now spending, then we would have effectively $75 million or twice our annual budget to spend on our own folks, which would mean way better schools, way better parks, you know, way better public transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And guess what? Pretty likely that everybody would be healthier. Um, and again, you guys all know this, our public health outcomes suck, despite, this, despite the fact that we spend twice as much as everybody else. Our life expectancy is 46th in the world. Our infant mortality is 50th in the world. We have unimaginable health disparities on the basis of race and language and location. And you know, again, you guys know this, that uh, the life expectancy of black Americans is four and a half years shorter than of white Americans. Um, and the infant mortality rate of black Americans is three times greater, but the infant mortality of white Americans is three times greater than the best achievable rates. So the infant mortality for black Americans is nine times greater than the best achievable rates in the United States of 2024. Our central challenge, to every time I stand it up and look at it, is actually primary care. There's very good data that suggests we're no more than 43% of the United States population has a meaningful longitudinal primary care relationship. <coughs> Don't give me usual source of care, forgive me. Um, but I, I think usual source of care is a garbage number because it doesn't really tell us anything. This number means something. In fact, only about 66% of people with Medicare, the best insurance in the country, have had a primary care visit within the last year. So we, you know, don't tell me that insurance is going to fix this, and don't tell me that access to care is going to fix it, because it ain't true. What this all means is that because there isn't adequate access to primary care, adequate use of primary care, that means that our emergency rooms, our hospitals, our specialists are massively overused, creating an economic space for market actors to come in and make profit on the backs of the public um, and on the backs of our democracy. So, new ideas that came out of our work trying to organize a social movement to change this. And I'll tell you why we did that. But the first idea is we realized that primary care is an essential service that every single American needs. And not only is it an essential service, but when you drill down on the cost of it, it doesn't cost any more per person per year than police or fire protection or roads or sewers. These are things that communities do for themselves every day and nobody calls it socialism. Um, <laughs> second, it's, and, and this, I had this, these words on, the, on a big whiteboard in my office when I was in state government. Mm. It's the denominator. Primary care for all is necessary for public health. They say for all, and I mean it seriously. Because unless we can address the entire denominator, again, this is something I think Jeff knows better than anybody, unless we get the entire denominator addressed, we have no way to get evidence-based prevention to the population as a whole. And so what we are doing is allowing preventable disease to keep killing <coughs> Americans. 
like the 53,000 deaths a year we get from colon cancer, which is a preventable disease because we haven't addressed the denominator. Like the, you know, I, I'm not, I don't think I have the number right anymore, but I think it's something like 30,000 new cases of HIV that occur every year because we haven't done evidence-based screening for, uh, we, have, we haven't done uh, opt-in opt screening for any, opt-out screening, I'm sorry, for anybody 13 to 64, which we could do because HIV is a preventable, treatable disease. Um, and like, you know, all the hepati hepatitis C that's out there that should have been stopped years ago once we had effective treatment. And I can go on and on and on through treatment to go for hypertension and treatment to go for diabetes. You know, some of the go for diabetes stuff gets a little nuts. But, you know, but, but I think you guys know what I mean. If we had everybody actively engaged in real primary care, the public health would be used better, would be usually better, and the cost would be a fraction of what it is now. No idea number three. It's the delivery system. It's not about insurance. Workforce matters. Payment reform is critical to our ability to function for sure, but it can be effective at addressing the health needs of the population without a well-articulated, well-designed, well-deployed, well-staffed, and inclusive primary care delivery system that brings primary care to every single person in these United States in every neighborhood and community. New idea number four, the workforce crisis is way bigger than most people realize, and that's why I think your work is so critically important. If 57% of the adult population doesn't have longitudinal conduit, longitudinal primary care, when you run those numbers out, that means that um, something like uh, uh, 147 million people don't, and at uh, panel sizes of 1,000, which I think begins to be reasonable, and I think numbers we just heard suggest uh, 500 is probably closer, but at 1,000, that means we need 147,000 new primary care clinicians to care for the unaddressed population, 147,000. <coughs> Does anybody know how many medical students we train, we train a year in total? Anybody know? It's 22,000. Anybody know what percent of those medical students are doing primary care? Less than 10. Less than 10. So 10 you know, I'm, what I'm hearing is about 20 percent, which means on kind a of good day, which means at best we're training 40, 4,400 4, new primary care folks a year from all specialties, and we're pouring that into a pool of need of 150 to 300,000 people who we need tomorrow. That's what we're up against, and I, as far as I'm concerned, I really think panel size is a big deal. Um, you know, there's new data that shows panel size shrank between 2012 and 2023 from 2300-ish 2300 to 1700-ish. But I think what I'm learning from my DPC colleagues is 500 is probably the right number to avoid burnout. And the reason that makes sense is that if you, you know, if, if we've loaded all sorts of new work onto people as we have done, um, and panel size of 500 is what we ought to be shooting for. People who are carrying panel sizes of 1,500 to 2,000 are doing the work of three or four people, and no wonder they're tired. <coughs> um, and the other thing to know is I looked at these numbers for Rhode Island, and I think it's about the same across the country, about 30% of primary care clinicians are over 60, which means gods of us are retiring and are going to retire over the next 10 years. And we ain't got nobody to replace. New idea number five, um, and Jeff, you, you know, you began to talk about it on the regulatory side. I kind of disagree with you that that there's enough political support for regulation to make it to make it stick. Um, but the the new idea is that state and local government actually have a role in addressing workforce and reimbursement policy. States can fund new medical schools, new nurse practitioner schools and primary care residencies for both. And let me tell you, I don't want to get involved in the, you know, the doctor versus nurse practitioner thing, but I'm pretty sure that we need, if we're gonna keep doing this nurse practitioner thing, we need residencies for nurse practitioners like we do residencies for docs. Um, 
And I don't know if anybody has, has capped to this, but now 50% of the primary care workforce are nurse practitioners. Um, like with variable training all over the place because we haven't standardized nurse practitioner training the way we have uh, tr the way we have standardized uh, family medicine training which is what this conference is about um, states can develop and fund scholarship programs with obligations like the old national health service board which i was a beneficiary of. how many people here were nhac people anybody but me wow um, that makes me feel really old <laughs> <laughs> but in the 80s, the NHSC was fielding 1,800 people a year, putting 1,800 people a year into our underserved communities. And better than that, giving them scholarships. So we identified them early and had, had students from our communities who might not see a pathway to primary <coughs> care to give those students a pathway. And, you know, I was one. I, the thing that got me to go to medical school was I was sitting in England writing books. And I saw that I could go to medical school and have my, my whole thing paid for, and then I wouldn't have to feel like I was trying to enrich myself. Um, and my guess is there are lots of people in our communities who are first-generation college students who don't think it's possible when they're looking at $500,000 worth of debt. Anybody want to guess at how many National Health Service Corps scholarships are available in 2024? Anybody know? It's 160. Down from 1800, we're in the oh, wow. while we're in the middle of the biggest primary care crisis in history. Local government also has a role. It can fund scholarship programs with obligation. You know what was that great show in Alaska? Um, uh, I'm sorry. Northern exposure. Northern exposure. That was the northern exposure story. But that comes from the 90s because you know that was the last time it was really happening. That was a local government funding. Go ahead. The number of National Health Service Board locations, is that based on state funding, national funding, or is it the number of clinics that fall within the criteria? Okay, complicated answer. Um, what I'm talking about is scholarships to students. So that number is now 160 to 180. The locations where people can serve um, are determined by a whole complicated formula. Um, and there are, you know, if you, you know, this is hierarchized um, among community health centers. You know, the good news is there are 14, there are 1,400 community health centers which have 14,000 different sites and provide primary care to 3, 30 million people, but they don't have anybody to do it with. Um, so, you know, it's great that the, the community health centers are there, but they don't have any staff either, which is why our colleagues who do community health centers, anybody one here? So, so you know what that's like. You're get, you know, you, you got to do what 4,100 patient visits a year, and you're probably carrying a panel of you know 1,800, right? Something like that. Um, and, and people are always pushing you for productivity, as if you were, you know, working. Forgive me for United Healthcare, because uh, it's the same dynamic. When you, you know, they're functioning in the market in exactly the same way even though they're government support. So, gov local government can, can, can fund scholarship <laughs> programs. Um, had, local government has a critical role promoting primary care um, and building the primary care delivery system itself. I can give you examples later of local governments that have done that. Okay, that was actually my question. All right, <laughs> I gotta be careful about time before. Okay, I just got the five minute thing. Um, and new idea number six, Nothing will change at the federal level until there is a community base to support that change. They are deadlocked down there, and they're going to stay deadlocked for a long time. There's a bunch of things that could happen tomorrow that would change this. Um, ACGME could require that 50% of all residency money to hospitals be spent on primary care training. Wouldn't that be a radical idea, um, given that there's a mound of evidence showing that the health systems with the best outcomes are health systems that are 50% primary care or more. Medicare and Medicaid um, could move tomorrow to a fair primary care capitation payment instead of this fee-for-service agency. I mean, you know, we've been taking fee-for-service in the gut for years, and we haven't stood up to push back. Um, the reason that it doesn't change is because we haven't organized ourselves to resist. 
And finally, as far as I'm concerned, we need a Marshall Plan or a moonshot um, for primary care workforce development. We've got to quadruple the number of medical schools and residencies like tomorrow. We've got to shorten medical school and probably combine some medical school and some residency <coughs> training to make it shorter so we can get more people out there. We've got to call back all those retired docs to be teachers um, because we could really get this going. <coughs> you know, the history of the United States is when we get behind the eight ball, we get ourselves together, roll up our sleeves, and get it done, remembering that ch what Churchill said about us, which is, you Americans usually figure out the right answer after you've tried all the other ones. <laughs> um, so we've created two new strategies. One is we're building local work groups in communities all across the country. Pat's developing one in Alexandria. We've got one coming in Cleveland. We've got one in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, you know, a couple more in Rhode Island. Uh, probably forgetting a couple. But we've got them working on doing things neighborhood by neighborhood and community by community um, to build the base as well as to take responsibility and exert agency um, providing primary care to everyone in their own community. Sort of Jeff's version of population health one patient at a time. My sense is this is primary care for all Americans one community at a time. And when we spread it, um, we will get more people primary care and build the political base we need to get the things we need done in Washington, because it ain't going to happen from writing letters to your senator and congressman. I'm sorry. I've been to talk to them, and their eyes blaze over. All they can think of is tinkering with various pieces of Medicare. They have no understanding of how things work and what everybody's lives is actually like. And strategy two, we're creating statewide work groups um, to bring primary care to everyone state by state. Um, getting them to build new medical schools. I'm working with some people to try to get a new medical school in Rhode Island. We need a public primary care medical school where 50% of the spots are reserved for folks who are going to commit to primary care, accept an obligation, and get to go for free. Now, I can't promise we're going to get it done like that, but we won't get it done like that if we just sort of write letters. We will get it done like that if we organize a couple hundred people who call up their legislators and stay at it. That's the kind of activism that we need, and that's what we, with Primary Care for All Americans, are trying to support, organize, we're, we're, we're training uh, facilitators. Um, we've got a whole structure going um, that really helps get this done, because this isn't gonna happen by itself. It's gonna happen only when we make it happen. There are a bunch of other things I'm running out of time that states can do. But that's not going to happen by itself, and, it, and not, no good regulator is going to make it happen. It's going to happen when we build a political base to change it, and that's what Primary Care for All Americans is doing. Because it will take a social movement to fix the health care mess. The history of the United States is the history of social movements that we put together <coughs> to fix our most difficult and urgent social problems, the abolitionist movement, the movement for women's suffrage, the labor union movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the movement for marriage equality, etc. Every 10 or 15 years, we lock up as a country, then we build a social movement, we burst it open, we fix the problem, and we resuscitate democracy both at the same time, and that's what we can do together in primary care for all Americans. So we're building that movement. Um, I had the huge honor of getting to know Dr. Bernard Lowne, who won, mm -hmm. won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 for helping design international positions to prevent nuclear war. Bernie taught me that if you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. I hope in the last little bit I've given you a look at what has been invisible so we can do the impossible together, remembering that I'm from Rhode Island. Um, where we have both a state bird and a state motto. Our state motto is hope. Our state uh, bird is the Rhode Island red, from which we learn it's always okay to hope as long as you're not too chicken. <laughs> we need your help. Please join us. This is how we get together on Zoom every two weeks for a short half hour to hour kind of community building exercise. But we need people to do what Pat did and what Alan and Gino are doing in their own communities um, and get started one or two people at a time 
you know, across a kitchen table or over a cup of coffee and then build it from the ground up. Thank you. Thank you.